All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone had a safe and fun and relaxing 4th of July weekend. I'd like to welcome you to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam and I'll be your moderator. Jill Hasselman is back with us again this month and she will review how you can save time and money using HR compliance software. Per usual, at any time during the webinar, if you have questions, type them into the Q&A section of your control panel and we will answer them live at the end of the presentation. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Henry Schein's Dental Business Institute, as well as HR for Health. Jill, welcome back. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I will never forget the moment about six years ago, I was sitting at my desk and my phone rang. And on the other end of the line was a doctor that before I could even really finish greeting her, I started talking so fast and she said, hi, my name is you know, Dr. So-and-so and I really need your help. I remember seeing a seminar that you put on a few months ago and you guys were talking about how I need to track my rest breaks for my employees. And I just got a letter in the mail stating I have to pay one of my employees $25,000 for missed rest breaks. And I need your help. I need you to be able to show that I've been offering them. And in that moment, my heart sank because although she had heard us uh, and she'd heard this advice and remembered it clearly because she was calling me, she did not make sure that she implemented that advice. And so my heart sank for her because unfortunately, the only response I could really give her was that I could refer her to our partner law firm. There wasn't anything I could do from a proactive standpoint to help her save money in this situation. At that point, it was really too late. The documentation was not happening every day. Each occurrence for her that the employee was taking a break was not documented. She didn't have that readily available. And so she had to go through an attorney. And what comes with claims like this and so many others isn't just that cold, hard cash we have to pay out to our employees. It also comes with distractions that it created, that it creates time away from the office, lawyers fees, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, even the sleep that is lost over some of these instances is not worth the money that could potentially be saved. And so this is just one example of the many calls that our team gets. And so we felt it was really important to go through what are some of the most common HR elements and how can we really recognize this as a big part of your business operations and looking at it as something that can truly save you money when you give it the attention that it needs. So a little bit of background on HR for Health. We were founded by an employment attorney who specializes in dentists. So the reason for working with dentists and the reason why he created HR for Health was because his clients were getting sued for very small things like the break example of not tracking that that I gave earlier. That's a true story of what came in. Um, really small things like that, not paying overtime. And these were things that were not being solved by just having an employee handle there needed to be something more. And so that's where we came in to build um, the software that helps uh, doctors stay compliant year over year. And the reality is in the year 2021, your employees in a lot of cases are more educated on what the laws are and what, they, what money they can get from you. A lot of the times it's recurring instances. We will see employees that have filed claims very consistently through different employers for the same thing because they know they can get the money. And especially right now where we're not having an economic downturn, but there has been some disruption due to COVID, of course, for our economy, that also can result in an increase of claims. And these are really easy things to file, but they're also really easy things to dispute if you have the correct documentation. And so that's our goal is to really make sure that you are able to save money, not just from saving yourself from lawsuits, but also saving time when it comes to how long it's taking you to do these administrative tasks. And so what we're going to go through today is, first and foremost, what is HR and why is it important? Um, what is the cost of our HR? Some do-it-yourself HR risks and some benefits to automating a lot of that stuff with the HR components through some software. As always, um, we love to offer free resources. Um, one of the new things that we came out with is an HR savings calculator. So if you text the word HR starter pack 
to the number 44222. So you text in your in the message box, HR starter pack, one word, and then to the number 44222. What we will send you is uh, this HR savings calculator. And what you can do is actually go in and it will do the calculation for you of how much time is really costing you when it comes to the HR administration. What is your turnover costing you and giving you some uh, recommendations on how we can reduce that. Um, on average, HR for Health saves about $60,000 a year for practices. So that's based on uh, preventing claims. It's also based on automating a lot of the tasks. So it's just a nice way to benchmark where you're at in terms of the cost that you're truly spending um, on your HR currently. And then also our team will do an HR risk assessment for you. And so what that does is actually go through a lot of the stuff we're gonna go through today, but through the specifics in your practice of what could it potentially be costing you to be out of compliance and then giving you some recommendations about what are some simple things you can implement that don't take a lot of time or money for you to just get buttoned up so that you're protected. So let's start, what is HR? Um, there's a funny phrase, our CEO always says it, that the, the problem with human resources is not necessarily the resources. So meaning the human element is what makes HR complicated. And it is really true. There is a lot of complexity when it comes to the human emotions and people's values, what they think they deserve. And that is a part of HR. There's, of course, the administrative part of it as well, which we're going to go through. But we want to actually break it down of what encompasses all of HR and also realizing that what makes HR so complex is that a lot of the elements that break down the individual specifics of HR are actually really interrelated. They interact with one another. And so when one thing changes, that can have a domino effect that maybe we don't realize when it comes to what we need to be updating in our processes or in our systems that we have in place. So let's go through it. Each of these HR elements that is included has a financial impact on the practice. And this could be because maybe you're not doing them correctly and that opens you to liability for a lawsuit. And of course that has a financial impact. But it also, there's a lot of administration that comes with each of these items, and that has a financial impact, especially if you're paying somebody a lot of money that are then having to do some of these things manually, that takes a lot of time away from your practice. And so that HR savings calculator can help you to really see where, where are you spending money that maybe you don't need to. And again, a lot of these things that are listed are interrelated with each other. So an update to a law, for example, could affect, let's say, the required benefits that you have to offer, which then could affect the way that you're tracking time and attendance and so on and so forth. So again, there is this ripple effect. And because a lot of these things change constantly, it's hard to keep up on. But let's break down each one. So when we look at onboarding, this is where a lot of the tedious administration comes in. So when we hire an employee, when we say, yes, this person is right for the practice, we're ready to bring them on board. On average right now, depending on where you are in the country, you should be giving your employees 12 to 18 documents on their first day of work with you. And so again, that can come with a lot of administration of having to print all those out, give them to the employees, make sure they sign them, keep them on file, know where they are, um, know where the updated copies are, making sure they're in a safe place. But this is all part of onboarding. The employee handbook is a big part of onboarding. That's a good introduction to the practice of what are our expectations and you know, how are you giving that employee handbook to an employee? Are you giving it to them at all? Um, are you keeping on file where they sign that? So that's a part of onboarding. Also just welcoming the employee to the practice, maybe having a new hire packet for them, a mug, a t-shirt, something to welcome them. Maybe you set up a um, mentor and mentee program where they get to follow somebody around the office and really learn from them. Um, but either way, no matter how you onboard somebody, there is that element of compliance. So those documents I mentioned, the 12 to 18 documents, that's non-negotiable. That's absolutely something you have to give to every employee on the first day of hire. And again, this varies depending on what state you're in. So that's something that I would absolutely recommend that you check on to make sure you have all of those 
and that you're giving them to the employee because that's how you start yourself off on the right foot. And again, you want to have a streamlined process that everyone's onboarded the same and it doesn't take too long. And we'll talk about some strategies on how to reduce the time in a little bit. Another thing is benefit administration. So how you know, for years it used to just kind of be, hey, I'm offering health insurance. Maybe I offer vacation and sick leave. Maybe I don't, depending on the size of your practice. And over the years now, what started to happen is there's been this big wave of sick leave laws getting passed in all different states. And so from California all the way to New York, there are mandatory sick leave laws that require you to offer a certain amount of sick leave to employees. Then we had COVID. We saw the FSCRA leave where it, we were required to offer certain types of leave to our employees because of COVID and so on and so forth. You see maternity leave. Um, a lot of states have protected maternity leave. So what comes with that is not only knowing what to offer and making sure it's compliant, but it's also the administration of that. And that's where a lot of the um, time spent can happen because not only are you trying to figure out how do I manage this? How do I administer this correctly? But then also creating a process to do so. And so there are those two elements. It's what am I gonna offer? What am I required to offer? And then how am I actually gonna track everything? And this also ties in a lot to payroll and timekeeping. So payroll is including, I'm sure a lot of you on this call are familiar with it, paying your employees correctly. It's a really big part of payroll. Um, making sure all the hours are correct, that um, they're paid on time. There are some risks associated with having to manually calculate hours for payroll, but it also takes a lot of time. So there is that financial risk of, am I actually paying them what they're owed? And am I paying them everything they're owed? But also, how long is it taking me as an office manager or as the doctor to actually calculate the hours and track everything to make sure that it's correct. But it's really important for payroll. It's really important to pay your employees when you say you're gonna pay them. And if you're not sure what the laws are in your state, that would definitely be something I would put on your notes of to do to just verify, are you paying your employees as frequently as you're supposed to? And again, if you tell your employees you're gonna pay them on a certain schedule, definitely wanna make sure that you're following that schedule. Timekeeping and attendance tracking is where a lot of money can be saved. Um, also where a lot of money can be lost if uh, done incorrectly. But it's one thing that it is the responsibility of the practice to maintain accurate time cards. So that is something, no matter where you're located, you have to be able to show the documentation of when somebody was working and keep that on file. But there's also laws that require tracking of vacation or sick leave, depending on where you are. So I think a lot of people think it maybe stops with just timekeeping, and some of you maybe are using electronic time clocks, which is great. But it's also important to have that sort of uh, documentation and paperless tracking for vacation and sick leave. Because again, if you're in a state that requires sick leave, you are required to track how many hours an employee has worked towards earning that sick leave, how many hours they've taken, how many hours they have remaining. And again, that's not negotiable. That's, that's something you have to do. So really important that those things are tied together, especially in states or even if you're in a state that doesn't require sick leave. If your policy says as you work, you earn a certain amount of hours, that should be tied together with your time clock. Because again, the risk of trying to manually calculate that is there, but also the time that it takes to figure out, okay, this is how many hours they've worked. What is that, what does that uh, correspond to in terms of how many hours they have available? So these two pieces are really, really tied together more than I think most realize. And the reality is if you are using a practice management system, that is a great first step. That is a, a great first step because it's an electronic time clock. If you're not using electronic time clock and you're using paper or verbal, please call us. Um, just hang up the webinar calls right away. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But you definitely want to get it into a paperless environment where it's electronic, date and time stamped. Um, this day and age, it's just you're just asking for a claim to come if you don't have it electronic. Um, but if you're using a practice management system, again, it's good, but it, it doesn't take you the full way. And that's for a couple reasons. One is what I just explained about 
vacation, sick leave, and the time that they're spending clocking in and out being tied together, the practice management system doesn't allow for that to happen. It's just a timekeeping system. So you don't have that attendance aspect. But also really where there's some holes in it is how employees have to edit their time or the way that they're not able to edit their time. And you know, it makes sense, the system, we don't want them to just be able to, hey, I forgot to clock in, I'm just going to edit my own time with no checks and balances. But the reality is when they go to you as the practice manager or as the doctor to say, hey, I forgot to clock out, please change my time. The date and time stamp of who did that is your username. It's not their username. And so it does open their open you up to a he said, she said situation where they might say, hey, I did not authorize for them to change my time, and they just went ahead and did it. So that documentation around why time is being changed, and if an employee, ideally you're using a system where an employee can request that time change, and then you're just approving it, you're not actually going in there and changing anything on their behalf, is ideal. And again, same thing for requesting time off. If you're in a state that requires sick leave, you don't want records of you just taking out hours of their sick leave balance. You want to show full record of them requesting the time off and then you approving it. So again, this is where you can save a lot of money, both in protecting yourself, because it's really easy to file a claim in this area, just because we all know there's so many little nuances. How do you keep up with it? But also to automate these processes, it saves a lot of time. Because if you do, if you're determined to be compliant in this area, it's going to take you a lot of time to try to do it manually. Document management is really, it might seem simple. It, I think it is, but it can be hard on a day-to-day -day basis. Really, it's documenting things as they happen. So what are the situations that are going on with your team, big or small? Um, really recommend keeping things consistent when it comes to document management. So if you're going to write somebody up for something, don't only write up the employees that you just like. You have to write up everyone if they're all doing those issues. And then you want to keep that on file for three to four years. So that includes anything you're having them sign, their timesheet records. You want it all to go in one place. Um, we do hear stories of, of practices before working with HR for Health that maybe the documents were all over the place or in a filing cabinet, or you know they might have all been together, but in a filing cabinet, and the employee went in and took the documentation because they sensed that they were going to be fired or, you know, they were going to quit for whatever reason. People do crazy things. But it's important that you're storing those documents in a really safe place. And again, ideally, it's electronic. So it's all in one place and you don't have to worry about where it is. Um, law updates. So this is really the piece that creates such a domino effect on all the other categories. Because as laws change, our systems have to maintain these things as well as adapt. So almost every law change affects something within this list of things. Almost every law change affects some sort of policy in your handbook or requires a new document to be distributed to employees or require you to track different things for their employment. For example, if you have a sick leave law that comes out, you have to all of a sudden really up your game in how you're tracking these different things. So this, again, is the catalyst, kind of. The other thing that's really hard is if we, you know, any managers on this call who might be responsible for knowing when laws change is it's happening constantly. It's super hard to keep up with it. And nobody calls you and tells you that these things are happening unless you have, you know, some sort of support, some sort of system who that's their job is to tell you when laws change. So it's really hard if you don't have a degree in HR to know when these things are happening. And so this is another area where outsourcing that piece and getting that support as opposed to having to rely on Google uh, can really help. Because I can assure you, Google is not the end all be all. I love it. I Google everything, but I don't Google HR things. I ask our HR advisors when I have a question. And then last but not least is performance and task management. So this is where all of our job descriptions, um, tracking if somebody is late, if somebody's clocking in early, doing performance reviews, that's where all of this falls under. So job descriptions are really important. I think that they are 
the um, probably most understated aspect of HR, but they are such a lifesaver in terms of hiring, putting out correct expectations for what the job is before you even bring somebody in the door. But especially once they're with you, that's basically saying, hey, this is my expectations of you. And then this is also your growth path. So being able to share other job descriptions with them for other positions if they're interested in growth is a great way to start to train somebody up. Again, it's also a great way to be able to hold somebody accountable. The worst conversations that have to happen are the ones that come out of the blue or feel very subjective. And so the more that you have in terms of the baseline of expectations, the easier it is to go back and rely on those things and say, this was very black and white. Here's what I expected of you. So using job descriptions as a foundation for those performance reviews, we recommend doing those at least once a year. If you're able to do them quarterly, that's amazing as well. Um, constant feedback is important. And then again, that documentation of that feedback in those conversations is absolutely what you want to be doing. Um, tracking things like tardiness or clocking in early. We'll go into that a little bit more in a bit, but this is absolutely a part of employee performance that I think gets overlooked sometimes, especially if it's your favorite employee or, or sometimes it's your least favorite employee where you notice it the most or you let it go more because it's your favorite employee. And this is something where it's really easy if you have a time clock that's telling you when somebody's late or telling you when somebody's clocking in early, you can really nip that behavior in the bud as opposed to having that resentment and maybe using that payroll component of HR to hold them accountable by maybe not paying them correctly for what they're owed. So all really important on the performance and task management side. And to go back to the top, a couple of examples to give you of resources that are out there. Um, again, just an example of what HR for Health has in terms of onboarding is we give you every single document that you're supposed to have for every employee on their first day of hire. Um, we're giving you the mandatory ones, even recommended ones, some that are just optional because we want to make sure you're covered. But these automatically send out to every employee on their first day, and then they're filling it out and electronically signing it. So that you don't, A, have to worry when a law changes and do I have the document, the most updated document. You don't have to worry about printing anything out. You don't have to worry about sitting with the employee for an hour while they fill all this stuff out. It just goes directly to them. And then as a manager or a doctor, depending on who's in charge of the onboarding, you get an hour of your life back, which is fantastic. That saves you money right there. Also, this is a screenshot of just the visibility that um, our system gives. Of course, there's other payroll companies out there, too, that can give this visibility, but it just is really important for an employee to be able to go in and see how many hours they have available, be able to request it right through the system, and then you're approving it. This is the best way to help you follow your employee handbook. There are so many practices that have an employee handbook, but struggle with actually using it. And it creates this, um, this issue between the employee and the office because they don't really know what to trust. And so here, you're able to say, this is my employee, po my policy for vacation, and here is exactly that mirroring in the system. So I'm going to go through some common HR scenarios that we see and some red flags and how to handle them. This is also a great time if this spurs up questions for you of situations you've had to go through, maybe you're currently going through, maybe you just want to ask them what if. Feel free to submit those questions as we're going through it, and we can definitely try to get to it at the end, or if not, our team will absolutely follow up with the situation. So things that come up that you may not realize um, can cause bigger HR problems. So I think, again, what when we go back to the very beginning of the point of this, what really costs us money is assuming that these big kind of claims are going to come to us, like, oh, you know, sexual harassment. I'm not sexually harassing anyone, so I can't get sued. That's really good. We don't want you to be sexually harassing anyone, but there are smaller things that can add up on a day-to-day -day basis that then result in bigger claims. So one very common one, one question we get all the time is, do I have to pay for overtime that isn't approved? I have been talking to doctors for seven and a half years on this topic. No matter where I go across the country, overtime is the biggest pain point. It is such an annoyance when you know somebody is milking the clock, and I get it. The issue, though, is having, holding that employee accountable for that problem 
by not paying them. And that's where these issues start to arise. And so first and foremost, you should definitely have in your employee handbook that unapproved overtime is not allowed. And then you should spell out for them verbatim exactly how they should communicate to you if they need to work overtime. Don't leave anything up to anyone besides those black and white expectations of this is what you have to do. And then even if they go outside of those bounds and you, they don't ask you the way that you're telling them they have to, you still want to pay that overtime. But you want to write them up. That's absolutely a performance issue. What you don't want to do is handle it by withholding money on payroll. Instead, write them up. And again, make sure you have a time clock that can tell you in real time when this is happening so you can nip it in the bud. Because I guarantee you, once you do implement a system like that, it happens one time, you write the employee up, and the behavior stops. The behavior is going to continue if they know that you can't really stay on top of it. And staying on top of it every time you run payroll, that's too late. It could have happened, you know, 15 times during that payroll period. So really important to pay attention when they're doing that. Have that expectation in your handbook and then follow your handbook. Write them up. It's black and white. It shouldn't be an emotional conversation. Another question that we get a lot is, can I hire volunteers? So the reality is that volunteer work is kind of non-existent in a dental practice. So, you know, you might have interns that in exchange for helping out, they're getting credit from their school, and you, you know, you want to make sure you're going through the appropriate documentation process with their institution of how they need to get the credit and documentation and all that. Um, but other than interns that are in that situation, you can't really have somebody that's donating their time completely. Um, another thing is that if an employee says that they will work for free for you, if they'll work more for free, that is absolutely a setup. It's a red flag. Do not let them do that. They're not just doing it out of the kindness of their heart. Make sure you're paying them. Um, and then again, if you if you have an intern following those correct processes. Um, do I have to pay for candidates working interviews? So working interviews can be a really good thing. They can also be a problem area if they're not done correctly. Um, so if you are going to do a working interview, just don't not pay them. So that's a problem that we see is a lot of doctors don't pay for the working interview. And the law says that as soon as someone does any work for you, picks up a phone, moves a handpiece, that that could be considered work and that it should be paid. So if you're going to do a working interview, you want to communicate beforehand um, what to expect, essentially, really black and white. So how much you're going to pay them, how long it will last, when they should be there. And you know, stick to that plan once you give them that documentation. And that should be done. You should give them that communication before they come in for the working interview. Another really great question we get, I just actually got this on the phone this morning with a doctor I was talking to, is can I terminate somebody in their introductory period? And the answer to that is the at-will conspiracy. So that's what we call it is there's this aspect or this safety, kind of this fake safety net that we hear a lot of, I can just fire somebody because they're in their introductory period and because they're at will. And that's really not the case. If somebody's worked for you for two days or two years, you want to treat the termination the same. So you want to make sure you have the documentation that you can show that they're not working out and then go ahead and let them go. So it's not to say that you can't terminate them because they're in, in their introductory period. You don't have to wait the whole time for them to be done, but the same rules apply while they're in their introductory period versus any time that they're employed with you, if they've been with you for five years. Um, another really frequent question, can I deduct pay for unreturned uh, property? You know, maybe you've lended out scrubs to somebody, maybe a laptop, big or small. Um, the reality is you cannot deduct from payroll or final payroll, especially a final paycheck, if somebody doesn't return that property to you. So it is unfortunate, but the money that you would have to pay for deducting is not worth the money that any of that property is worth, I promise you. So if you have to change the locks for whatever reason, because they have a key, that's not something you can deduct from their pay. So it's really important that if they, you know, if you have to have them pay you back in some sort of way because it's agreed between you and the employee, 
you're getting help from an HR advisor to make sure it's kosher, make sure you have the documentation, that you can't just deduct from somebody's paycheck because they left and didn't bring back whatever you lent them. Um, what happens when my employees don't show up to work for their scheduled shift? So this happens a lot, especially right now. Um, and it's really important to have a strategy for when it happens. So you want to think about handling it the same across the board, no matter who it is. So this is, again, where maybe it's our most consistent employee. All of a sudden, they're having an issue coming into work, and you want to maybe let it slide. But the reality is it's much better to handle that the same way you would handle an unreliable employee. And first and foremost, you want to have it in your handbook. Here's what happens. First and foremost, here's what we have established is considered late in our practice. If you clock in X amount of times after your start time or X amount of minutes after your start time, and also what your no show policy is. So, how far in advance do they need to call you? What do they need to do if they're not going to be able to come in? How many instances is acceptable before you're ready to write them up? And again, all of that is more or less up to you. It's just important that you have that strategy thought through and then have it in your handbook. And then, last but not least, holding them accountable and documenting the instances. Uh, another question, can I have my employees verbally communicate their work hours with me? This is definitely a red flag. So as I mentioned, it is your responsibility as the employer to maintain accurate records of time worked for each employee. So if the, ac the records are not accurate, it is the employee's responsibility to notify you of that. But it's then your responsibility to maintain that all of the, the records are accurate and thorough and that you're keeping those on file. So you really want to make sure you have a bulletproof documentation process when they're going to change their time. I, again, mentioned with the practice management software, we realize a lot of that happens through post-it notes, through text messages, verbal confirmation. You want to make sure you have a solid documentation process that you can keep on file for many years to come in case it's ever pulled in an audit what happened. Do I have to approve employees' vacation requests if it does not work for my practice? Simple, plain and simple, no, you do not have to approve vacation if you can't accommodate it. Um, again, recommending that the expectations are laid out in your handbook and then that there is a system that you can document this with. So, for example, a lot of practices maybe need to shut down for a week because the doctors go on vacation. You can require everybody to use vacation during that time. And you just want to have that really clear and then have them be able to put it into a system. Also, if your handbook policy says you have to request vacation two weeks in advance to be able to take it, you want to make sure you have a system where you can track when they're requesting it so that you can hold them accountable and have it, again, be a black and white situation. No time wasted. It's just you requested it a week before. We need it two weeks before. I can't accommodate this. So the the more you can make it non-emotional, the better. So starts with the handbook and then needs to be paired with a system to allow the employee to do, to do what you're asking them to do. Uh, can I require a doctor's note when my employee calls out sick? So this is a maybe, it depends on where you're located, depends on if you have a sick leave law in the area that you're in. So it's not just state specific. There are some counties that have sick leave laws, some cities. So make sure you're checking that. If you do, basically, this is kind of a blanket statement, so make sure you're checking your seat. But you cannot request a sick leave or a doctor's note until they have exhausted all of the sick leave hours that they have available. Once they've used their sick leave hours, then it's usually okay to ask for a doctor's note. But until then, you really can't do it. And also keep in mind, a lot of these laws do cover needing to take sick leave for employees, or I'm sorry, for children or spouses or family members. This, again, varies state to state, but just keep that in mind as not just saying, hey, I need a doctor's note or denying that request. You want to make sure that you're in compliance with that. So the importance of HR is really what's interesting of the way that COVID kind of brought in with HR is that we realize now it's not something that can be ignored anymore. When all of the practices across the country were faced with a decision of, do I lay my employees off? Do I furlough them? Do I terminate them? I have to shut down my business. 
this really came to light of if you've been ignoring HR this whole time, if you're not making sure that your hygienists are employees and not independent contractors, that all of a sudden became an issue during COVID because they couldn't get unemployment. And so we now know that this has to be, this is not no longer a nice to have to pay attention to this. And it's becoming more complex because employees are becoming more educated and laws are constantly changing, especially again post COVID era of trying to deal with the unemployment issues and the, the leave that sometimes still needs to happen due to people testing positive to COVID. It's just getting a little bit more complex. And so it's really important that you're paying attention to it. And again, it has a financial tie to it. And that doesn't necessarily mean straight payroll costs. It also means saving money by how quickly or easily you're automating these administrative tasks so that you're not just protected, but you're able to focus on other things. So it really is a ticking time bomb. Uh, you know, the story I mentioned in the beginning, this is it's such a great example of kind of what's happening under the surface. And what happens is it doesn't seem like a problem until it is. And then it's almost impossible to really wrap your head around because so many of those pieces are interconnected. So you might not have an employee handbook. That might be what triggers a lawyer to want to take a case from an employee, but they end up looking at everything, timesheet records, how you're documenting the employee's performance, if you're documenting it at all. So it's really connected, and that can seem very overwhelming when it comes to, to a head. And there's just too many rules and regulations that a small practice with limited resources is able to follow. So it's really important that you realize you know, there might be some things that are going on even before the pandemic. Now the workplace rules are a little bit different. And so it's really time to create a sustainable plan that brings in fair practices, fair HR policies that are compliant, and don't put the practice at risk for, for any money. So, you know, the employees know the rules, I can assure you. And, you know, 95% of all the rules that apply to you also apply to a Fortune 500 company. So really want to get those tools in place. The other thing, some stats here of an average claim from an employee is usually about two times that employee's salary. So if an employee is making 20K a year, that's about 40 to 80 on average that would be paid for that claim. And that's a lot of money for the practice to have to just pay out of pocket. And so if you look at it on the flip side, spending 250 bucks a month on a system and HR advising that could prevent this from happening is like nothing compared to 40 to $80,000. Um, and if you don't have a system in place, if you don't have those 12 employee documents or your handbook hasn't been updated for a few years, or maybe you're calculating wages by hand, all the, those little things that could add up before they do, if you implement a system, you can kind of prevent those issues from coming to the surface. And because you're, get, you're making things right from the beginning and you really don't know when they're going to pop up. So the sooner, the better. But also, even our lawyers will sometimes use that, can use that as an advantage in court of, yeah, maybe they did all this stuff wrong. But look, even before there was a lawsuit, they implemented these systems to make it better. So it really is a nice way to save money and not have to lose sleep at night. Also, on average, to replace an employee, it's about six to nine months of that employee's salary. So not having a process to be able to retain employees can absolutely affect the revenue of the practice and the money that you're having to spend. Um, a missing I-9 form alone can cost between $500 and $5,000 in terms of a fine, and that's just for the first defense of not having an I-9. So there's these really small things that can add up. And Almost about $10,000 a year is wasted in ineffective onboarding processes because there's about 54 administrative tasks. You saw all of those new hire documents. That's just one part of onboarding. And so it, there is a tangible dollar amount that is connected with bringing in these systems. And probably the best part of all is it reduces turnover. You know, there, the reality is, and maybe some of you have heard me say this, is that your employees are now, your current employees and future employees, are expecting the same experience at work as they have as consumers. So meaning they can order something on Amazon, on their phone, know exactly when it's gonna be there for them and when they can expect it. 
But that means they also want that as your employees. That means transparency to their employment, transparency to expectations of what you expect from them, knowing how to meet those expectations and so on and so forth. So you know, there's nothing an employee loves more than being paid correctly, I can assure you. There's nothing they love more than being paid on time and recognizing their anniversaries and their birthdays, doing performance reviews, and again, giving them that transparency so they feel ownership over their employment with you and like they know exactly what you expect really creates a completely different environment that creates happier employees. And the ones that don't want transparency, that don't want oversight, might not be the best ones to have on the team. So what are some risks of doing HR yourself or trying to create your homegrown systems? And we understand that a lot of the systems in your offices are homegrown because you know maybe you started your office with one, maybe two employees, you've been growing it year over year, and you've had to, as issues come up, just kind of put systems in place that you did the best that you can. And I'm a big fan of do it yourself. My dad's a huge DIY guy. Um, but you know, just because he can build a shelf really well doesn't necessarily mean he should be our pool guy. He's been our pool guy for like 15 years, just Googling everything and teaching us how to jerry-rig the pool, make sure that it works. And again, the reality is once that breaks, we all don't know what to do. And the system's just not working for us. He can no longer Google how to maintain our pool. And so while he might be able to fix it, it's really not the best for all of us involved. And the same is for HR. You have absolutely things in the practice that are your expertise that you really like, but trying to keep up with the laws that are always changing and then putting those systems in place that involve the post-it notes and text messages, or sometimes just ignoring the requirements altogether, and then trying to teach your employees how to keep up with them, it's really just not efficient and it runs a lot of risks. And the two probably biggest risks we can look at is, first and foremost, it takes away from the time you get to spend with patients. As a small practice or small business owner, you need to save every penny you can, but doing things yourself takes up time and resources, and it can be really confusing. So even if you yourself as a doctor, maybe you're not figuring this stuff out yourself, but your managers are, that's also taking their time spent away from bettering the practice in different areas. And also not to mention, unless they're an HR professional, they might not be getting the most accurate information. Like I said, I Google everything, but I don't Google HR advice. You want to make sure you have a team that knows exactly what the laws are in your situation and can, can help you with that. And then also it can create errors. So really common errors of trying to do things yourself is incorrectly calculating things like vacation, PTO, overtime, so common. It's why the lawsuits are so high because it's so easy to file a claim with it. Um, not tracking which policies or documents you've sent to the employee. Again, do you give the employee handbook to everyone? Do you know that for sure? Did you track that they were able to sign it so you can use that to hold them accountable? Do you know where all of their new hire documents are? And is there that transparency? Um, not documenting conversations that you've had with your employees really is a problem. It creates a lot of issues and it can also create errors when you're making employment decisions because you don't have something to refer back to that's really solid. It's your own subjective memory. And then, of course, not tracking the latest rules and regulations that you must follow. That can create errors among everything because, like I mentioned, it's a domino effect. You could be operating on an old law that you think is still legitimate that maybe is no longer, and then it's just affecting all of your systems. So using an HR software, a lot of benefits, of course, preventing, preventing risk. So we want to lower your risk profile as much as possible. Of course, nobody can say you'll never get sued. But ideally, if you do have a claim that comes to you, you're able to have a very low risk profile. And also, it's really easy for a lawyer to just go through one system where everything's in one place. So that cost goes down a lot in terms of what you're even having to pay a lawyer if it gets to that that um, place. But ideally, it's just preventing the risk because the employees have transparency, they know what's going on, and there isn't that resentment, which can create lawsuits. It also creates efficiency. So again, if you have managers that are having to, to manage all of this, I guarantee you, they really don't like it. It's probably their least favorite part of their job. They probably really want to be growing your revenue. Or if you're the one doing it, I'm sure I'm speaking directly to your heart of what you're feeling. 
We just want to be able to do dentistry. And so the efficiency of what today's technology can bring in can really expedite those tasks, either with a click of a mouse, or you don't even really have to worry about them all because they're just that all because they're running in the background. Transparency is a huge thing, as I mentioned, not just for your for you, that's important, but also for your employees. It's really important for them to know what's going on with their employment. How many sick hours do I have? That might seem like such a small thing, but to an employee, it really shows, okay, you mean business. You care about me. Not only are you investing in a software that helps make my life easier, but I also feel valued because you are showing me what I have and making sure I can take it and that I don't have to ask you and you say, I don't know, I have no idea, but you can take the hours anyway or you know, whatever happens when you're not tracking it. Um, automation, I cannot stress this enough. There are so many things you can automate that take away tasks completely and really reduce the time and money that you're spending. So running payroll and just a few clicks, just a few uh, seconds, boosting your team performance by having a kudos system in place that employees can just interact with, um, automatically knowing when somebody's late or clocking in early and automatically having that documentation, automatically knowing when it's time to do a performance review and having that initiated on your behalf. All those things that are almost impossible to keep up with, not only can they be in one place, but they can also be automated. Um, compliant timekeeping, I cannot overstate this enough. So the importance of calculating those hours correctly based on your state regulations is so important. So using the practice management software is great for what it's supposed to be, which is patient oversight, patient documentation. You really want a time clock that's focused on protecting you and making your life easier. And that comes with a lot of automation in terms of calculations. Also tracking those meal and rest breaks that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, that's really important if you're in a state that requires that, having a system that just notifies them, hey, make sure you're taking your break, make sure you're taking your break. So you're not having to do it and it's documented in the system if there's ever a question on if you were doing it or not. And then electronic documentation, so you don't have to worry about where is anything, completely eliminating that while automating a lot of the stuff that's sent out to your employees. But having the documentation doesn't just include a physical I-9 or that physical documentation. That's part of it. But it's also documenting all of those leave requests that we talked about. Somebody's taking pregnancy leave. How are you documenting that? Even if somebody's taking vacation, how are you documenting that and making sure it's in one place? Um, the performance management side of knowing, hey, it's time to do a review and we're going to go ahead and do it. Holding your team accountable is the best use of your time possible while using a system to make sure you do it efficiently. So termination should never be a surprise. And we don't want to completely eliminate that human interaction. We just want to make sure you have the tools to easily do it. Because if you don't, then it's like, okay, I will get to it tomorrow. And then tomorrow turns into next week and then the following week. And that documentation just never happens or it becomes vague and it's not as effective as it could be. So really important along with all of the new hire paperwork. And this is just a screenshot of an example of our software. As an employee, there's total visibility to when they're gonna be paid next, all of the hours they've worked, all of the documents you want them to sign, their sick leave vacation they have available that I showed you. So this is again, just a screenshot example of ours and that gives that transparency we've been talking about. And as we kind of wrap up, as a reminder, um, all of your employees are expecting the same experience they are getting as a consumer. I cannot overstate that. I know this, this seminar is not necessarily about hiring or retention, but it is such a problem. There's 100% employment in dentistry. And the best way that you can retain your team is by giving them these things to have that transparency to their paid time off, to the handbook, um, not having to figure it out yourself and giving yourself a compliant time clock while well, you're also able to track, are they late? Are they clocking in early? Are they working on approved overtime? And so on and so forth. So our goal is to prevent issues from arising. And if they do, walking you through the proper steps. So our HR support paired with the software really does that. And um, making sure you have your employee handbook is essential as well. And it shouldn't be up to you to update it. It's just too much time and, and money spent that you could be spending elsewhere. 
So as we wrap up, I want to remind everyone if um, to get the HR savings calculator and um, the HR consultation to go through where's your risk at, you can text the number 44222 and the word HR starter pack is one word. So again, this calculator helps you to understand how much money is your HR really costing you. It's going to look at turnover, average salary of employees, et cetera, et cetera. And then the HR risk assessment will actually go through a lot of those segments that we broke down for what makes up your HR. And then we'll give you recommendations on what, what are easy wins that you can implement pretty quickly. So I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions, Adam. So I'll kick it back to you just in case we do have some. Well, I am not seeing any at the moment. So we'll give about 30 seconds or so. We've got yeah. 10 minutes left. If anyone does have questions, type it in the chat, type it in the Q&A, we'll get it answered. In the meantime, today's webinar was recorded. So everyone will receive the recording sometime in the next week. Um, if anyone has additional questions for Jill, the HR for Health team, or just in general about our webinars, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com, or you can visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. I have to say, regardless of where any of the attendees are, we just had an earthquake here in Northern California. So if you were with us, you just experienced an uh, earthquake with us. Oh, wow. <laughs> Well, with that did come one question. So <laughs> uh, let's see, does your company follow the guidelines for each state, uh, the practices in and look up and follow the state laws automatically? Yeah, so the software is tailored to, depending on what state you're in, the documents, the timekeeping, all of the rules around that will be state specific and then the employee handbook as well. So part of what we do is notify you when laws change and basically say, hey, this is, this is how this affects you. Here's what you should do. So we do keep you up, up to date on that stuff. So you don't have to worry about it, but then also you can call us if you have questions on anything that comes up and we'll help there too. Awesome. Well, that's all I got. No more questions. Good. So got off easy tonight. <laughs> yeah, I guess I did. Thanks everyone. Awesome. Well, thanks Jill. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.